here. Bill, um, as hopefully you know, is the editorial director for Billboard. He's been there for uh, eight years now. Eight years. Um, and it's kind of risen up in the ranks. Prior to that, he was working at Rolling Stone, correct? And before that, was a freelance writer. Um, you probably know he is used as a guest to speak about music and business on pretty much every Fox News, CNN, Today Show, you know, every every news um, program on cable TV. So anyway, I'm really excited to have him. He's just going to share a little bit about the story and some advice to you, and I hope that you are thinking about some great questions to ask him. So would you give Phil a big welcome? Oh, yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, First, say uh, it's uh, it's always it's always a sincere honor, uh, very humbling to be asked to speak to uh, anyone, uh, certainly a group of students. Um, I'm not sure if your parents knew that this is what they were paying for; they'd be happy. Uh, but we'll see what we get by the end of the session. Um, you know, I'll also say that uh, I, you know I told myself last night that I had to speak to a group of students this morning, and that. I was really going to behave, and then uh, after the BMI awards, there was a Universal Music Party, and then there was a big party at uh, Mark Wright's house. Mark Wright runs Show Dog. <laughs> yeah, they say what happens at Mark Wright's party stays at Mark Wright's party, but unfortunately, I will stay at Mark Wright's party. Um, but I figure if there's one thing that a group of students should find relatable, it's a hangover. So we'll <laughs> see what we get with this. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've spoken to students uh, once or twice before, a couple times. I've been, I've been, uh, like I said, uh, fortunate enough to do that, um, and, I, and I find that uh, generally, uh, what's useful for me to talk about with our time uh, is a couple things. One uh, is how to get a job. How many people here would like to learn how to get a job? That's kind of no-brainer. Uh, and two is what it takes to succeed in that job once you have that job. I tend to prefer to talk about those things because when I was a kid coming up, no one really talked to me about those things. It was easy to find experts to talk to me about, you know, this business or this field of study. Um, and I have no idea what your curriculum is here at Curve, so maybe it absolutely addresses this. Uh, but one thing I think is generally lacking in the way people are prepared to in the world uh, is any discussion of uh, leadership. You know, leadership, leadership theory, uh, really what it takes to sort of be accountable and succeed. So I've just observed over the years that uh, the conversations I have with students, that it seems to me students find the most meaningful, uh, is a conversation about those things. And then afterwards, uh, with whatever time we have left, or I, or I just told Hannah that I'd make some time and uh, maybe grab some lunch after as well, uh, you know, if you have questions about the, the business, uh, I'm happy to try and answer those. But frankly, these days, uh, as quickly as things move and as great as the focus of music industry programs are, you guys probably know more about the music business than I do. So uh, we'll see where that goes. I'm kidding, you don't. But, <laughs> <laughs> but again, we'll see where we get. Um, yeah, so it's just, um, I'll, I'll say this. I, I think um, I'll tell a little bit of my story first. Um, I, you know, I grew up in Delaware. Um, and, uh, you know, just really protective parents in a spectacularly uh, white trash neighborhood. And, um, you know, I had no inkling that I would ever uh, have a career path like this. I wanted to be a high school English teacher. Uh, but when I got to college, <laughs> when I got to college, uh, all that sort of overprotectiveness suddenly was gone. Uh, and I discovered uh, an awful lot of music scenes. Uh, this was a great time. I got to school in, in a fall of 1991. I got to the University of Delaware fall of 1991. And that was when you know, Lollapalooza was launching, and that was when, I mean, there's just so much going on in music at that time. Uh, it felt kind of amazing, kind of exciting. Uh, I mean, you know, Grateful Dead were still talking. It was just like so much happening. And, uh, you know, I got heavily into music, and I got heavily into um, uh, some of the uh, predilections and accoutrements that go around being heavily into music as well, and uh, promptly fell out of college. Um, I don't recommend that. It's not a strong group path, but it, it was the one that I had. Um, you know, it's kind of funny looking back in retrospect because I, you know, I had a lot of guidance counselors and a lot of uh, teachers tell me, you know, if you don't stop, 
spending all your time going to these music clubs, you know, you're really never going to be able to have a career. And I love talking to those people now um, because that was really the only way. Uh, I don't know. You just got. I mean, that's just kind of the way it unfolded for me. So you know, eventually I went back to school, um, and uh, I still wanted to be an English teacher, but they told me. I remember I was registering for my classes, and the uh, the guidance counselor there was kind of like, well, "What? Why are you registering for all these psych like courses?" And I was like, well, "I'm going to be a high school English teacher." And uh, she said, "She said, well, you know, you need a, a 3.25 to student teach in the state of Delaware. And if you don't student teach in the state of Delaware, you can't be accredited, and you have like a 0.8. And so mathematically, it's impossible for you to be a student teacher. It's probably impossible for you to be a teacher. Which, in retrospect, what an awful thing to tell someone, right? Like, I don't know what's wrong with that woman." Because I'm sure there were like a dozen ways I could have been a teacher, and maybe I would have been a great teacher, but probably it's better things ended up the way they did. Um, and so, yeah, I, you know, I was an English major. And basically what happened to me is at the time I was graduating from college, the, the sort of emergent music scene that I was discovering was the, uh, was the rave scene. This was like 93, 94, 95, and uh, dance music was going to be the next big thing, which for those of you that are paying attention today, uh, you see how things sort of are cyclical. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And, uh, you know, what happens is, and, and money drives everything, right? So what happens is, is these record labels are taking out ads for the first time, trying to advertise their, you know, next big thing, dance music, and whatever music magazines are covering dance music. And so suddenly music magazines who want to get on that gravy train are looking to hire people who can write in complete sentences about the rave scene. And that is the bill that I fit. I could write complete sentences about the rave scene. And so I moved to New York. Uh, my first job paid me fifteen thousand six hundred dollars a year. It was at CMJ. Uh, I lived in the basement apartment of a Peruvian family in Woodside, Queens. Uh, it was not really big enough to fit a mattress. And I'm not kidding. I literally wedged the mattress. It was a closet. Um, and it was the best. I mean, I'll just be honest. I mean, it was the best time, probably. In, I mean, in some ways, it was the best time in my career. Uh, because I was living in New York and I had a job, I had a reason to be there, uh, and I was on a path. Um, a couple things that were important about that time. One is by virtue of um, by virtue of being in that scene, uh, you know, the way you found out about parties in 1994, 1995 was largely uh, through what became sort of the building blocks of the social web. So it was, you know, Telnet chats and listservs and things that you guys today probably don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. But, you know, this eventually evolved into, uh, you know, IRC and then AOL and Instant Messenger and then, you know, chat boards and all of this kind of, you know, that's what you found about parties. And so by virtue of that, by virtue of being with a group of people who were very technology focused, the music was technology focused, the discovery mechanisms were technology focused. Uh, I was inadvertently preparing myself for this revolution that really today is still only just beginning. And I'll talk about that in a minute also. Um, so that's kind of, I mean, you know, from there, uh, you know, the, the important split that happened for me is uh, I moved to New York City thinking I wanted to be a music critic, uh, but I really pretty quickly became as interested in uh, the, the platforms, like the way people were getting music uh, as I was in the music itself. And I'm still like a just diehard, passionate music fan. I listen to music for hours a day. Uh, music inspires me. Music makes me cry. Uh, music is, is everything, um, and, and I find, frankly, that when I'm having a period where it's you know it gets too corporate, it's too much about work, or I'm uh, you know doing uh, too much that isn't music, uh, there's nothing that recharges me like just going out and finding a, a good night of music. Uh, I think it's really important you never lose sight of that. You know, if you don't really, really, really love music, there's way better ways to make money if you're a smart young person. So you know you should ask yourself that because if, if that's not the if that's not the real the real motivating thing here if you don't want to like live that life in music that's like the number one perk of working in the music business that's like perk one through nine and if you lose track of that or if it's not your thing you know like I said there's there's better opportunities out there because it's hard it's a hustle um, so yeah when Napster, when Napster launched. Um, that was kind of a pivotal moment for me because you know I just started asking questions. Um, I didn't understand why they would shut Napster down, why the labels and publishers would want to shut Napster down. It seemed like it was, it was like the greatest record store that, that I had ever dreamed of. Um, and that's you know I mean I, that's when I kind of started learning about these things called rights and there were these things called publishers and you know and, and that's really that was kind of a pull of thread that took me off in a certain direction, which was I became really fascinated. 
No, I'm just kidding. I, I, I became really fascinated by uh, this intersection of music, uh, technology, and law, culture, technology, and law, and the way these three things were, were interacting. Because you know, law really couldn't keep up with uh, the intersection of culture and technology, and you know, culture really couldn't keep up with technology. And technology didn't seem to give a crap about either of the other two. And it just led to sort of these rapidly shifting uh, sort of tectonic shifts that, you know, today you see, uh, you know, you see those starting to be, become realized. Uh, but at the time, really, no one had any idea. So I was writing these stories. I wrote one of the first National Magazine stories on, like, the MP3. And, you know, I was completely wrong in almost everything I said. But not a lot of people were even looking at that space at that time. So I was sort of in the right place at least. I was in the right ballpark. I go back and read that story once in a while, and I'm like, it's a good reminder of how wrong we can be when we're staring at something too close. Um, anyway, I mean, I guess long story, not so long. Uh, I left CMJ after a couple of years, wanted to become a freelance journalist. Uh, you know, had the promise of. Um, a monthly column at CMJ that was going to pay me $100 a month. And one assignment for the Village Voice that was going to pay me $400. And I was like, I'm good. I have this. I've got this made. Um, and, you know, so subsequently I ate a lot of peanut butter for uh, the next year or two while I figured out how to be a freelance journalist and, you know, sort of make some relationships and, and uh, wrap my head around where things were going enough and made the right contact so I could really start telling the story of where culture was heading and you know sort of how it interacted with, with technology and law. And it was a great time. Uh, just by show of hands, how many of you know what the Gray Album is? So the Gray Album was a, um, that's okay. I mean, I think far less of you now, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> the Gray Album was a, 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 essentially like a, like a, a mashup created by uh, Danger Mouse, the producer. And uh, God bless you. And and what he did was he took the Beatles' White Album and Jay Z's Black Album, and he, he basically like sort of remixed the Beatles' beats and used Jay Z's rhymes and sort of remixed those a little bit. And he created this thing called the Gray Album, and people had no idea what to make of it because you know the Beatles certainly at that point hadn't licensed a thing to anyone, and there was like I said, there was no law that covered whether this was good, bad, ugly, whatever. <coughs> those are the kind of things that I love to write about. Um, I created an opportunity for myself, and that's an important lesson I think for. Uh, students is that, uh, you know, at the New York Times at that time, uh, the, the people who were writing about music just wanted to write about, you know, the big artists and review them and what is Bruce Springsteen doing at the concert. And uh, the people that wrote about technology just wanted to write about, like, IBM. And so this, this notion that uh, there was this gray space in the middle, uh, no one was really paying attention to it, and, and that was fantastic. Um, I took one course in journalism uh, when I moved to New York, because I never studied journalism. Uh, and it was a it was a course in a literary nonfiction with Joan Didion and Joseph Mitchell and all these great authors that kind of turned the, the real life around them into amazing stories for people to read that uh, you know had all the elements of narrative fiction but you know were actually just based in fact. Um, and uh, one of the great things about that class was they brought in a, a series of speakers and uh, Nick Lemon, who was the head of the well now he's the head of the Columbia Columbia Journalism Program, but at the time he was a he was sort of like the senior political writer for The New Yorker. Uh, and his message was, you know, 99%, and I think this applies to broadly, it applies to almost every industry. He said 99% of journalists are all chasing the same story. And if you want to be successful, go find the 1%, right? Like, don't, don't hunt in the pack. Go off and find like a whole different food source. And that was really, that was really something I took to heart. Um, Yeah, so as a freelance journalist, I mean, you know, I was a freelance journalist about four or five years. Uh, Rolling Stone uh, offered me a job. I took a job at Rolling Stone for about a year. Uh, it was fine. I went from writing stories that were uh, kind of moving markets. I'd go out to a party on, like, Tuesday night, uh, sent my editor a note, you know, that night when I got home. Uh, by Wednesday afternoon, we were editing the piece, and by Thursday morning, it was, like, shaking things up. Uh, I went from that to Rolling Stone, where, you know, I was writing, like, 300 word dumbed-down versions two weeks later. Uh, and it was kind of painful. I didn't enjoy it. I uh, really, like, you know, for those of you that follow me on Twitter, um, I just really, like, the, the, the energy of, like, real-time communication and dialogue is, is kind of one of the things that really drives me. So, you know, I learned the wrong stone wasn't the right place for me. Um, Billboard made me an offer uh, that I couldn't use, and I wanted Billboard to be the news editor. And, uh, you know, 
it's kind of right place, right time. Um, it turned out that what the music industry needed in terms of who was running that trade publication uh, was really someone who thought a lot about the intersection of culture, technology, and law. I, I didn't necessarily know that that was the decision I was making when I decided to stop trying to review the next you know, Coldplay album and start uh, writing about kind of this direction and set of ideas, remix culture and all of this, but uh, that's the way it worked out. So I'm going to take a quick step back and, and, and tell you a couple lessons that I've learned from that. Um, like I said, I never took a journalism class. And so when I, when I moved to New York to take this job, I've always been fairly ambitious. And I, and I knew that like, I, you know, my goal wasn't to just like, be the guy that got the clubs for free and you know, got a future mom from the publicist at 3 in the morning. But you know, I, think, I think I really wanted to, I, at that time, what I really wanted to do was be the kind of writer that just like, you know, kind of spoke truth to power and uh, unearthed important stories and told great stories and you know, change the world through, through ideas. That's really what I, what I wanted to do. Um, and I, I knew I needed to be better as a journalist because uh, I, I was really bad as a journalist. I never studied to become a journalist. And so at the time, uh, CMJ's offices were out in Long Island. And so there was a reverse commute, if you know what I mean, uh, where you know, most people are sort of jamming on the trains and coming from Long Island into the city. I was uh, getting onto an empty train, you know, going out to Long Island from the city. But well, what happened is the trains would come in and they, everyone would leave their, uh, back then people read these things called newspapers, and uh, they, would, they would leave all these newspapers on the, on the seat. And I would grab up, uh, always the New York Times, uh, usually New York Post, because I was really colorful and, and some good writing, some fun writing, and then like maybe one other paper. And on my 40 minute ride, uh, I would basically uh, just, I'd find the stories that I wished I was writing, and I would devour them. I had a pen in my hand and I would diagram these stories, uh, that was really my journalism class. Was reading, uh, you know, at the time it was like Neil Strauss and Ann Powers were the author, were the music journalist leads at uh, the New York Times. Um, you know, and I would just read their stories and take them apart. It was like kind of what's the lead? How do they start this? Uh, what's the nut graph? What's the point of the story? How do they structure it? Uh, you know, how do they use quotes? How do they end the piece? Like just really, you know, really just take it apart and mark it all up. I mean, the people. I mean, it was like. Uh, it was like Russell Crowe in a beautiful mind. Um, I mean, it was, it, was, it, was, it was obsessive and it was frightening for people around me. Um, but I, you know, I, I knew that if I really wanted to do this thing, I had to get a lot better at, 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 at my own skills. Um, there's a couple other examples where, you know, what I, what I, what I, what I cancel is just sort of ruthless self-accountability. Um, you know, most people, when uh, things aren't going their way, you didn't get the job, or you're at the job, and you didn't get the promotion, or you know you, you didn't get this assignment, or you didn't get this opportunity that you really felt you deserved. Uh, most people, I will say, and this obviously doesn't apply to those uh, in the present company, but most people tend to uh, look elsewhere. Most people say, "Oh, you know, my boss is a jerk," you know, or you know, that's someone else's fault. It's, it's anything that isn't me. And, and the one thing I will say that that I found really sets people apart in terms of, because you know, I've been blessed to, to spend time with uh, some wildly successful people, uh, people who are holding the positions right now that I think probably most of you would love to hold at some point in your careers. And, you know, I mean, there's some bullshit that goes on, and, and there's, you know, there's people that get there for the wrong reasons. But I'll tell you that, that by and large, uh, overwhelmingly, the people that get there, the people that stay there, and the people that accomplish the things that you want to accomplish, they look to themselves first. They really do. If something's not going right, if something's not working out quite the right way, uh, it's about you. And if your first like ten questions are about you and what you could be doing differently and how you could affect that situation differently, you're probably on the right path. It takes people a while to really understand this because it's easier, it's much easier, although far less productive, to say, oh yeah, you know, that didn't work out because of this. You know, but it's a, it's a pretty powerful thing. I'll, I'll tell you, when I first moved to New York City, there were probably about 12 or 15, uh, you know, aspiring young journalists that I would see it, you know, we'd kind of all be in the same clubs and the same stuff. And, uh, and I'm not being, uh, I'm not being sort of falsely humble when I say if you line those 12 or 15 people up, I was probably like nine or ten on the depth chart of talent at that point. These are people that had gone to good journalism school. These are people that were better writers stylistically than I was. Um, 
But most of those people, I mean, again, I hate talking about myself, but it would be weird to be quiet if I didn't in this situation. Um, you know, I don't think any of those people are still in the business in any capacity. And so, there, you know, my point is, you know, talent is great, but that's kind of that's kind of the baseline. Like, everyone's going to be talented. Everyone in this room, I'm, just, I'm certain, just looking at your freshly scrubbed and bright faces, um, everyone in this room has talent in your, in your own way. And, you know, when I go to speak to the Bandier program at Syracuse, or I go to speak to the Clyde Davis program at NYU, uh, those people all have talent, too. You know, and, and by the way, there's, you know, I think 95 other programs. Uh, and those people are all really talented. And by the way, there's like 100 people in front of you who already have that job or already graduated from those programs for every position you could possibly want. So you have to ask yourself, you know, what's really going to set you apart? What's going to prepare you uh, to kind of be the person that gets that thing? You know, when I was a, a freelance journalist, uh, I, my, at the time, uh, one of my pinnacle goals was to, to write for the Sunday Arts and Leisure section of the New York Times. Uh, that was just, you know, that was what a lot of my friends read, it's what I read, I loved it, it's where all the great writers at the time were, uh, were writing, and I really wanted to be in that section. And I was already writing for four or five different sections of the paper. Um, and I, you know, I kept sending pitches and I wasn't getting any answers. And that's a classic situation where, again, most people are like, all right, you know, screw it. You know, that editor is an asshole. They don't realize what they're missing. I am brilliant. And, you know, this is, you know, that editor doesn't know what's going on. Screw them. Right? Um, but when that, you know, the dust settles on that version of events, and then who has the problem? You know, like, the editor doesn't know that I have stuck pins in a doll that looks like the editor. <laughs> and the editor's still working in the New York Times, and I'm still on the outside, not having accomplished the thing I wanted to accomplish. So, and I'm just saying, because I, 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 again, a lot of those 12 to 15 people, like, that was their response when they didn't get the call from the editor. You know, instead of thinking, well, like, why isn't this editor responding to me? Right? Because editors need to publish good stories, and I think I have good stories. So, either A, uh, my stories aren't as good as I think they are, maybe I should work on that. Or B, uh, maybe I'm not reaching the right editor. Maybe I'm not reaching the editor at the right time. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Like these are all the things that you need to think about. What are the variables that you can control? Um, so I called the New York Times uh, main line uh, and asked to be transferred to the arts and leisure desk, hoping that you know, like a clerk or an intern would, would answer the phone and not someone important. And that's what happened. And I kept this this guy on the phone for probably 40 minutes. Um, just pumping him for information. You know, I have these kinds of ideas. Who are the right editors? Uh, what time do they come in? What's the day of the week? Because it turned out, like, I'm a big believer in systems. I, you know, I manage a lot of creative people. I think I manage about 60 people, and they're all creatives, right? They're designers, they're writers. Uh, and I find that one of the most important things for managing creatives is giving them structure, right? Giving them lines so that they can just focus on the color, essentially. Because what creatives are generally not so good at, like most people, and not everyone, but most people are either left-brained or right-brained, right? And if you're sort of oriented around creativity, a lot of times you're not so oriented around like organizational management skills. You're not so oriented around detail. You're not so oriented. So like you can provide structure and process so that it lets people sort of free that part of their brain. That's a really important thing. Um, I have a lot of structure for myself. I, I was always experimenting with these sort of approaches. Um, like an example of this would be, uh, once I sort of started making enough money as a freelance journalist, but I wasn't worried about getting evicted, um, I, I basically sort of set three rules. And any assignment I took had to meet two of those three rules. And the three rules were, uh, one, it had to pay me a lot of money. Two, it had to be a story I was really passionate to write. And three, was it had to be for a publication or an editor uh, that I just really wanted to work with. And I wouldn't take an assignment unless it met two of those three things. And that kind of kept me moving forward in a certain kind of way. I also had all these rules around when I would reach out on my communication. Uh, I would never email, I would only email people Monday, Tuesday, usually Monday or Tuesday, sometimes Wednesday. I would only email people between like nine, if it was an important email, it was like a pitch, if I was trying to get someone's attention, if I was trying to really swing factors into my favor, I would only email people like, I would say Monday and Tuesday, and usually between like 9.30 and 10 a.m. Right, because like fresh, early in the week, early in the day, that's a great idea. I had really good success doing that. Uh, but it turned out when I called the New York Times editor that they closed uh, the Sunday Arts and Leisure section, section on uh, Wednesday. Right, so Monday and Tuesday was the absolute worst time I could possibly be emailing anyone, and I was emailing the wrong editor for the kind of stories that I wanted to write. So you know, I mean, once I had that information, the next pitch I sent 
couple of brief ideas, and I got my first assignment from the Sunday Arts and Leisure Session. That's sort of, when I talk about like ruthless self-accountability, relentless self-accountability, that's what I'm talking about. Most people don't do that. Most people are like, oh, this didn't work out, we'll move on to something else. But like, that's the thing I wanted to do. So you just have to like, you can't take no for an answer, and you have to, and by the way, not taking no for an answer doesn't mean sending the same email a thousand times, because I think there's laws against that, that's stalled. Um, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean doing things that are stupid. It means like really being proactive and figuring out like, okay, I keep hitting this wall, how can I get over the wall, how can I get around the wall, how can I take the wall down, right? But I'm probably not going to just like bang through this wall and it's really be working. So I think it's an important lesson. The other thing I'll say for my freelance sign that's really important and I want to share with you. Um, do me a favor, everyone stand up for just a quick second. I have no reason for asking you to do that. That was just fun. Um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, so I want you to um, I want you to stay standing if you have experienced abject failure in the thing that you thought was your biggest dream. Sit down if you have not experienced abject failure in the thing that you thought was your biggest dream. You've all experienced abject failure in what you thought was your biggest dream. Tell me about abject failure. What have you experienced? Me? Sure. Yeah. You don't know? Yeah. Well, sit down. Everyone stay standing. If you have not, I'm going to ask each one of you. So if you have not experienced complete and total failure of the thing that was your dream, <laughs> sit down. <laughs> By the way, quick aside, learn how to follow directions, people. It's not that hard. I almost didn't come today. You know what? I was on Twitter. Did you guys, how many people here found out? Well, let me finish my point. My point about the abject failure. My point about the abject failure is, uh, I told you I wanted to be a writer, right? Like I wanted to write these stories that change the world. And uh, I had this opportunity to uh, go to Amsterdam with the head of the Drug Enforcement Agency and sit down in a coffee shop. And by coffee, you know what I mean. Not hard. <laughs> with the head of the DEA and come back and write that story for Harper's Magazine, which at the time, and still to some extent, was really like one of the top two or three magazines of ideas. And I came back from that trip, having had that exact experience, and I shit the bed like few people have ever shit the bed. I absolutely blew it. I couldn't, I had writer's block, I was scared, I didn't think it was good enough. Writer's block just means you're, you're afraid, you don't think it's good enough, right? Whether you're writing a song, a story, or whatever. Um, I was late, I finally filed the story, she was like, ah, it's okay, let's work on it. Then by, I tell you, I've taken so long that the head of the DEA got moved to be the, the head of the Department of Homeland Security, Asa Hutchinson, and I'd blown it, right? And I was so devastated by that that I, I, was, I wanted to leave journalism. And that's, like, that's just absolutely real. I was like applying for jobs that were like manufacturing jobs. I was applying for like anything. I was just like, let me just go, because I've blown it. Like this is my one chance and I've completely blown it. I'll never get a chance like that again. And I wasn't wrong, I will never get a chance like that again. But the point is, obviously, it's like, there's, there's two important things that come from failure. One is you realize once you <coughs> calm down, you realize that uh, there's a million other opportunities. The flexibility, like you may think your dream is one thing and it could turn out that your brilliant career is something else. And two, you know, you just, it, it's great to learn the humility that comes with that. I failed, right? I fail all the time in small ways. I fail sometimes spectacularly. And I, and I hope that one of the things you've heard from the speakers that have come through here is that failure is kind of where it begins. You really don't know anything about yourself. You really don't know anything about what you want. You really don't know anything about what your career should be until you have just completely blown it. And I will add that you are not taking enough chances if you're not failing. If you're not failing big, I mean, you know, there's ways not to fail. <laughs> don't get arrested. Be a good person. You know, but if you're not failing big in your career, I really encourage you to think about this because you're in the age of entrepreneurship. You're in the age of like take chances. People ask me all the time, what should I do? What part of the business should I get into? And I say you should get into the business of you. If you're not like, you guys want to work in the business, you want to be marketers, you want to be label presidents, you want to be managers, you want to be whatever you want to be, you should be doing that right now if you aren't. Because there's like bands that you can go outside and trip on one right now. And they need, they need publicity and they need management and they need marketing and that's your laboratory. And some of the school programs that I've spoken to are fantastic about almost mandating that, and others maybe less so. 
But whatever it is they're asking you to do on the field of a, of a truck ownership, you should do it like times 100. I appreciate you guys standing up that whole time. You guys can sit down. <laughs> um, I literally thought about, about not coming this morning. Hannah, cover your ears. Um, because, you know, I was on Twitter. And everyone was really excited on Twitter. It was really nice and gratifying. You guys said some really nice things on Twitter about how excited you were to come and that sort of thing. And that's nice to hear. But the, but the first thing when I, when I tweeted that I was coming, because I was the first person that told the world that I was coming to Curb. Sorry about that, Hannah. No, it's um, great. You know, but I jumped the gun because I was excited to come talk to you. I said, hey, everyone, I'm going to speak at Curb. Send me your questions. Let me know what you want to talk about. So everyone stand up again. Like, oh, there's like the editor from Spin or the editor from Rolling Stone. We gotta like go talk to that guy. 
And I just felt like the dynamic was awful. Like I had nothing to offer that person other than my my like desire to like have them hire me. You know, I hated that. I just think that I just think that knowing what you want to do and working hard to get there and being a really nice person while you do it is like that's the whole secret. It's not complicated. People want to. I mean, I read all these marketing books and I read uh, what's his name Seth Godin. I mean, I, I think most of this stuff is idiocy. I really do. Like, it, it's like people a lot of times read these self-help books and these sort of commercialized, you know, how to think pro books and these kinds of things as like an excuse to not do the thing they already know they need to do, right? Oh, I'm making myself better. I'm like reading this stuff and I'm learning and like, no. Like, you, you, know, you guys sitting in this room right now know everything you need to know. Uh, I mean, you do. I mean, maybe there's, I'm sure there's like more details and tactical information about the music business and, you know, tort law and all these things that you're going to learn more about. But, I mean, you know, what you, you know what your dream is. And you probably know what you need to do to accomplish that dream. You probably know who you need to get to or what your idea is. I mean, you know, you just got to stop and ask yourself, what does it take to get there? And just do those things. And don't wait. Don't wait for tomorrow. Don't wait. You should walk out of this classroom and go, like, do something that changes your reality. Because once you start to do it, it's an incredibly powerful feeling. You realize that, like, how much power you have. I'm a big believer in, um, in creating a more sustainable world. And a couple of years ago, I got tired of like hearing myself talk about that and complain about it, and I started making life decisions that reflected that. And one of the bigger decisions I made was that I went vegan. I don't eat dairy, I don't eat meat. Anything that came from an animal, I don't touch. I wear leather. It's not a, it's not, I'm not like a pro-animal guy, and I like to fish even, so it's not even like I'm afraid to kill animals. The phrase not the right word. We'll head down the tape. <laughs> you sissies and you're not killing animals. Um, the reason I'm telling you this is not so long you can become vegan, although I think that would be a wonderful thing for the world. The reason I'm telling you this is because what I, what I didn't realize was going to happen from coming vegan, I anticipated that like, I would feel proud of that choice, I anticipated that it would have health benefits, but what I didn't anticipate was it made me feel like a thousand times more powerful because it was hard to do and I just did it. Right? It's really hard to go vegan. You go into a restaurant, if you're a vegetarian, you can always find something to eat. If you're vegan, man, they put butter or cheese and just about everything on a menu. So you have to have like conversations with waiters and waitresses all the time. And you know, when you're at that important business launch and you're like, uh, is there a parmesan in the soup? It's a little distracting. But the power of making a choice, of, of actualizing it, of realizing it, of, of like taking a, a, a step forward and doing something that's important to you, I mean, I can't tell you how that reinvigorated me to sort of recognize the power I had to change other parts of my life, or recognize the power I had to just like make a difference. So when I hire people, people always ask me like, what do I look for when I hire? What I'm always looking for, you have to be skilled. That's a, that's a no-brainer. Like I said, everyone's talented, everyone's skilled. You have to be skilled in the thing I need you to do. If I'm hiring a designer, I want to see your work. I want, I want to be amazing. You have to be a good person, because you know we all work long hours, and I believe in good people. If I think you're a schmuck, I don't want you to work here. And in fact, if I think you're a schmuck, I don't want you to succeed in the music business, because we're all full up on schmucks. And I'm not a person that thinks the music business has a lot of schmucks. I think most people in the music business are great people. But if there are two schmucks in the music business, that's too many schmucks. <laughs> no schmucks. <laughs> and you have to burn. Like, you just have to burn, and that's like kind of an intangible thing. Like, I talk to people, and I want to see like a little glimmer in them of like that young idiot that like called the clerk at the New York Times desk. I want to know that like you're gonna you're gonna like figure out how to get around that wall. And it's not you can't just sit there and tell me I'm gonna get around the wall. Like I ask people to tell me stories about themselves. I ask them to tell me like tell me about a time you really failed and what did you do. That's I mean I'm just looking for people that burn. And by the way, I mean that's a good general rule of thumb. Like I'm looking for people that burn everywhere in my life. Because I don't know how much time I have. You know, I could walk out of here and get hit by a bus. So I just I don't understand. There's like no waiting around. Right now you think you have all the time in the world, you're gonna blink and be my age. I promise you, it's the way it works. It kinda sucks. As my dad always says of aging, it beats the alternative. But every day there's like some new indignity heaped on you. Your hair moves from your head to your ears, it's fucked up. <laughs>
It goes fast though, people. I'm telling you, it goes really fast. So just don't leave anything on the playing field. And leave it all on the playing field, I should say. You know, like get out there and do your thing and, and don't let anyone stop you. That's really what it's all about. So I'm going to stop speaking extemporaneously now. Uh, I think you probably have about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, yes? 10, 10, minutes, 10 minutes? 5 minutes. 10 minutes? 10 minutes. So uh, I know you didn't have any questions for me on Twitter. I'm hoping you may have some questions for me now. Yes? Yeah, create success and let people come to you. Okay. What do you want to do? I want to be a managing manager. Are you managing Bam right now? I am actually. Yeah, so do a really good job at that. And then get your story out there. Make it about the band. Don't make it about you. Like figure out how to how to create demonstrable metrics that show you're doing a good job. You know, what was your YouTube following, you know, 12 months ago, six months ago, three months ago, now, what's it gonna be in three months? Uh, you know, uh, Social networks are a great place to sort of help tell a story. One of the ways the business has changed substantially in the last 10 years, five years even, is, I mean, a is so data-driven now. And most labels don't really want to take a chance on someone until they've already created their own story. Once upon a time, the labels created that story. But now they kind of want the story already largely created, right? You know, Justin Bieber was like the, you know, the, the guitar player on the street, the troubadour. You know, that was already a story that was created. Jordy had millions of followers. You know, uh, what's that name? There's a country singer who just cracked the top uh, five or ten at iTunes last week. <coughs> Thomas Rhett. What? Thomas Rhett. I don't think that's it. Or maybe it is. There's a country singer who cracked the top five or ten at iTunes. He doesn't have a record label. Uh, that, like, wow, I mean, feeding friends. I was up in New York talking to label presidents who don't even usually think about Nashville enough, and they were all like, gotta sign this guy, gotta sign this guy, gotta sign this guy. But, you know, get yourself noticed, right? Just focus on the work. Because if you're managing the band, do you believe in that band? Is that band awesome? Yeah. Should, should that band be the biggest band in the world? So start making that happen and don't worry about that work. You know, call people that you need to talk to because you have an opportunity for them around that band. You know, don't sell yourself short. A lot of times, one of the things that I had to change when I got to Billboard, it actually took me a couple few years to realize this. Uh, you know, and this this I could easily spend 30 minutes talking about this, and I don't want to take your time that way. But I had to change the culture. A lot of people felt like if they were asking for an interview or they were going to ask someone to like be in Billboard, they almost had to apologize for doing it. And I had to change that culture. They were like kind of survivor culture. You know, it had been a crazy five or six years before I got there. Steady decline in the music business. Steady decline in the journalism business. Usually when I talk to schools, I mean, it's almost funny, right? Like I work at the intersection of two of the most fucked industries in the history of the world, right? Like journalism and the music business. Congratulations. Um, it's awesome, by the way, right? Because we are, people think the revolution has happened or it's mostly happened. Revolution hasn't even begun to happen, people. Like, I, I saw a statistic the other day from Nielsen that said 92% uh, of ad dollars are still going to uh, broadcast TV, print magazines, and print newspapers. 92% of ad dollars, which means only 8% of the dollars that make the whole world go around in media are going to like digital and social right now. Wait until that number gets to like 30 or 60 or 80. You know, I mean, the, the music is, is still, I think it's really on a global basis, and, and don't quote this number because if I'm certain of one thing, it's that this number's wrong. But I was talking to someone last night at the Universal Party, someone very, very senior who knows these numbers like the back of his hand, and he was telling me that the, uh, the, the, the percentage of recorded revenue globally that comes from physical is still like in excess of 50%. The revolution is nowhere. I mean, we've literally just begun. There's like 12, 15 million people globally subscribing to streaming services. There's 325 million people just in America. We haven't even started to bundle it with phones. I mean, it's, 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 you know, you guys are in a great position because you don't have the context for what the music business was like five years ago or 10 years ago. And that's like the greatest gift that you have. You know, these other people who feel like, you know, they, they're just like, they're, they're a lot of them are survivors. Now, most of the, most of the survivors are shaken out of this. Right? Those, those, I mean, the people that are kind of like scared and you know don't really want to embrace the future. By and large, those people are gone. <laughs> anyway, I think I just answered three other questions that you didn't ask. But questions? Yeah. What's your favorite aspect of the job? Um, my favorite aspect of the job has always been and remains uh, the energy that comes from communication. 
right? It's, it's, it's like, can I make a difference by sharing ideas? Can I make you better at your job? Can I make you better as a human? Can I make you think differently about uh, the music business and the world around it? That's absolutely the best part of my job. So this is the best part of my job. Twitter is the best part of my job. Putting out these ideas every day, every minute, every week on, you know, for an iPad and websites and a print magazine, like it's definitely, you know, listening to people. I'm not doing a lot of listening today, but, but listening to people. You know, hearing kind of what's important to these different people. Um, and trying to, to fill that, that need. I mean, it's a challenge, right? Like I joke about the intersection of music and, and media, but it's, it's a real hustle. And like that revolution that I'm saying that the music business is just at the beginning of, I mean, the media business is also just at the beginning of. And so sort of, you know, just hopping from sort of ice flow to ice flow and, and trying to figure out where mainland actually is in two years or five years or 20 years or if we ever come out the other side. I don't believe that there's another side, right? I just believe there's a continuum of change and that, that's never going to slow down. So that's, that's really the best part of my job is, is having this laboratory to experiment with media and with ideas and with people. And I mean, and sort of part of that also is management. I love, I love managing people. I love, um, you know, I, I hope that the people that work for me will look back and say that I was a tough son of a gun and I was really demanding, but that I held myself to absolutely higher standards than I, than I held my staff to and I made them better at what they do. That's what I hope. I care a lot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is like your incredibly broad question. But um, where do you see like, music like going right now as far as like taste? Like, That's not broad at all. Why would you say that? I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. It's pretty broad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'll, a couple quick general observations just from looking at the billboard charts. Um, over the last 18 months, I'd say, uh, dance music is bigger than it's ever been in the history of the Billboard charts. It's crept into every style of music, even country. You know, I'm now funny dance. Uh, is getting ever dance here, which is fun to talk to like the, uh, the old guard of country music is, I mean, this is, it's like the Antichrist, <laughs> right? And yet, you know, it's happening. Um, so what I would observe from that is that, generally speaking, when you look throughout history at the periods when one style of music was like deafeningly ascendant, the pendulum, even though you may not see it, is already swinging the other way. I'm not really a big believer in EDM. Um, ironically, I came from that scene, so I have a pretty good perspective on that. Um, I just, yeah, I mean, that's, I guess my main, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of uh, sort of renewed energy around rock again around guitar. I mean, there's no guitar. Like I started listening to country music uh, a few years ago when I would travel around the country because if you wanted to listen to like guitars on radio, the only place you could hear that was on country stations. Which is crazy, right? Like as a kid that grew up in kind of the age of rock and roll, it was it was like that's where we'd come. Like the rock station doesn't play anything that sounds like what I would call rock and the country station is now playing what I used to call rock. Um, you know, I mean if you go see a Jason Aldean show, if that's not rock and roll, I don't know what is. This dude's got like four freaking guitars on stage. And, and it's like huge riffs, and it's, you know, I, mean, I don't know. So I mean, I, I can't tell you where music's going. I can't tell you where the industry's going. I think that, um, you know, broadly for, for music, like I said, I mean, it's ever changing. I think you're in the age of a thousand, uh, thousand niches. You know, the opportunity is there for anyone uh, to sort of create their own base and not worry about it. It used to be so rigidly format driven, right? Like, and the only way to break a song, the only way to really have a hit, was to, uh, you know, you take it to radio, they play it a whole lot and create demand, and then, you know, you get into the stores, and that was like the whole music, that was the whole recorded music industry. Right? And now there's obviously, I mean, there's, there's half a dozen uh, proven ways of creating a hit, and probably scores more that haven't yet worked, but will, you know, upload an awesome video to YouTube and become Psy. Right? And, and what, what happens with that is it changes the game of A&R, and it changes the opportunity for different styles of music kind of out there. That guy did not like my answer. <laughs> He's like, I like EDM! <laughs> uh, yeah, question? What's your biggest fear, and how do you combat like the voice of fear when it really is trying to jeopardize what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, it's not healthy, and, and uh, the various therapists I've spoken to over the years would definitely confirm this. Uh, but, I mean, I'm very driven by fear. Uh, you know, 
know, I, I, I barely graduated from high school. I failed out college. Uh, you know, I think that I have a chip on my shoulder to prove to all those people who are like, you know, if you just keep hanging out with music, you're never going to make anything of yourself. And it's proved to an awful lot of people that, that told me, I don't understand for the life of me, anyone who would tell a young person they're not going to succeed. I really, like, I can't even fathom doing that ever. Um, but I guess it depends on your worldview or how your dad treated you when you were a kid or something. But, um, you know, I, I just think my, my biggest fear, I mean, A, my biggest fear is doing anything that would embarrass my staff or my brand. You know, it's a, it's a business uh, that happens after hours, and, uh, you know, you have to be circumspect. You know, if not, I, I know I, if you follow me on Twitter, it may seem like I'm always at a party, but I'm not always partying. I'm almost never partying, you know? I mean, I was joking about being home over, but it was a joke. I was out last night from uh, about 6 o'clock until about, uh, I don't want to say what time, but like, way late. Uh, you know, it was a good, you know, 9 or 10 hour night, and I had two drinks, right? So it's not about, like, I had a great time, but I have a different kind of great time than a lot of people have. Like, because I've learned, like, four new things. So like I think the number one thing is like I, I just like, the thought of embarrassing my brand is probably number one, or embarrassing myself, or letting my family down, anything like that. Um, but you know, I mean, you, you get older and things change, right? Like I, I have kids, you know, I have a seven-year-old and a three-year-old boy, and like the things I used to think were important, it really kind of keeps those things in perspective, you know. Time for one more question. We're done. We're, We're done. Here, Stay forward to me. Y'all have um, some good questions. Y'all can come up and meet Bill. We might push you outside to get the 11 o'clock. Really quickly, um, thank you guys very much for the opportunity for uh, letting me come speak to you. I really enjoyed this. It was good for me.